Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm joined by Doug Bush of Chartsmarter, joining us from New York. We'll talk about the energy sector in a little bit of detail, see what sort of opportunities may lie in one of the worst performing uh, issues here recently, but starting to show some strength when others are not. Other names testing resistance. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is really designed to empower investors to better quantify investor behavior. I would argue all the fear and greed, the supply and demand, the euphoria, the desperation, all of that is represented best by price and by analyzing price over time using simple price pattern analysis, but also things like trend analysis and momentum factors and uh, other sort of it technical indicators, we can better identify where the trends are, identify where their opportunities may be, and certainly anticipate when trends may be reversing. We're sort of in that interesting point right now, I think, as we uh, sort of getting to the end of the month of May, beginning now the seasonally weakest half of the year, as we talked about Jeff Hirsch uh, with Jeff Hirsch last week on the, on the show. So what does that mean? I think we have a lot of stocks that have been incredibly strong year to date, a lot of them facing significant resistance levels. You're seeing some areas of the market pull back from resistance, others sort of setting up. And the question is, is there enough upside momentum, enough buying pressure to push not just up to these previous highs, but push onward and ever upward, as it were. We'll have to see what the charts tell us over time. But let's get today wrapped up with our market recap. Let's look at some of the uh, movements today. I do want to start with a poll question. We always have a poll going on our live stream page at StockCharts.com. We asked you recently, how important are seasonal trends in your process? About half of you, 48%, said I use them occasionally, but not very often. I actually don't have a huge problem with that. Uh, seasonality is not my main uh, you know, approach to the markets, but I found it to be incredibly valuable. And I will say it's, it's, uh, it's cyclical, right? There are times in the year when I find it's really valuable because there's a certain calendar-based phenomenon that can be really important. Uh, for example, in uh, the end of the year with the Santa Claus rally uh, in January and thinking about how the year starts and what that might tell us about uh, you know, events to come through the course of the year. And I would argue in May and in October, sort of these two general places, because we're now kicking off the weaker half of the year, things don't tend to go as well over time. Uh, and then in the fall, when uh, the market has often had a uh, significant bottom in September and October. I'm concerned about the 7% of you that say, what are seasonal trends? Go back to my interview with Jeff Hirsch on Thursday of last week. Hopefully that'll answer that question. None of you will answer that next time. And then think about when uh, you want to intentionally incorporate seasonality into your investment process. We have a great seasonality uh, set of tools on the stock charts platform, of course, but let's look at how the market has played out through the course of the day today. As I uh, sort of alluded to, a bit of weakness through the course of the day today, one of the weaker days that we've seen in, uh, in a little bit of time. You can see on the little two-day preview chart of the S&P 500, yesterday feels like sort of a sideways uh, digestion day. Today, sort of a slow and steady move to the downside. Let's zoom in a little bit on what happened to the major averages. You're going to see a lot of red here with the Nasdaq composite down about one and a quarter percent. The S&P 500 down 1.1 percent. The Dow doing the best, but still down about 0.7 percent. Mid caps, small caps all down as well. Worth noting, small caps actually almost finished the day narrowly in the green, but the rest of the market sort of dragged things down. And by the end, uh, small cap S&P 600 pretty much a wash from yesterday, down about 0.1%. The VIX in the green up about 1.3 points uh, to get to 1855. And again, this is the highest level we've seen in the VIX here in recent weeks. Uh, I, I would argue that the bear case for stocks, in my opinion, most likely has the VIX pushing higher uh, and, and probably above 20. So we're making progress toward that level. But, you know, as I'm looking at the S&P testing resistance at 4,200, I'm looking at uh, key stocks testing resistance like NVIDIA and Apple and uh, Coke and Pepsi and others. I'm also looking to see if the VIX can eclipse that 
20 level, which would most likely be a pretty negative sign for risk assets. Interest rates, for the most part, moving higher. You can see, or excuse me, moving lower, that is. Uh, pardon me, I meant bonds moving higher as I'm looking at this. The TLT was up about a third of a percent. Interest rates in general moving, uh, moving lower, although the short end of the curve uh, pushed a little bit higher yet again. 10-year yields now down a bit, just below 3.7%. Long bond yields around 395. Short end of the curve still above uh, 5% for the short, uh, short-term yields. Uh, the dollar ETF, UUP, was up about 0.3% today. A bit of a mixed bag with commodities. You had gold slightly higher, silver prices lower, copper prices down about 1.1%, natural gas prices uh, down as well. But crude oil prices moved higher a little bit. And, uh, and the energy sector, I guess one of the lone shining moments in the, in the markets today is a decent update for, uh, for energy, while most things were actually struggling quite some bit. So perfect time uh, for, uh, for my guest today, Doug Bush, to, to dig into the energy space a little bit, see if there's some opportunities we can, uh, we can see in that particular sector. Just to finish up on our market recap, cryptocurrencies, for the most part in the green, you see Bitcoin just above 27,000, uh, just below 27,200. That's up about one and a quarter percent from yesterday. Ether um, uh, up almost 2% from yesterday, currently around 1850. Uh, sector returns today, energy up and everything else was down. So it was literally energy and then everything else. Uh, the worst performing sectors, materials, technology, uh, both down about one and a half percent from uh, from yesterday. So, you know, it's interesting. There's sort of those traditional uh, labels that we have for sectors. Technology is generally offense, consumer discretionary uh, and others. I, you know, I, I find those are sort of very broad generalizations of how these tend to perform. Uh, technology, in a lot of ways, is performing as offense and as defense, depending on what part of the technology sector I think you're looking at. Arguably, the mega cap tech names are as defensive as you could get, with certainly within that sector. But, but arguably, relative to other things, that's about as stable and strong of a trend as you're most likely to find right about now. Let's look at a daily chart of the S&P 500, then we'll finish up looking at some stocks and themes. So a day like today, the problem for the S&P chart is today all of a sudden makes the chart look very different. Through yesterday's close, we're talking about testing 4,200. We're talking about you know closing up to it. That was on Thursday of last week. Friday and Monday session, we opened and traded above 4,200 only to close back below it. Today, we're really sort of feeling like a drop off of resistance. So for now, this appears to be sort of a confirmation of resistance at 4,200. You know, who knows where a, a drawdown, if we would continue, would go to. I've immediately eyeing um, this blue shaded area, which is 4050, uh, which are the lows from April and May. It's the 50-day moving average currently around 4085, 4090. Um, those are the areas. And 4100, of course, sort of that, that big round number we've talked about. That blue shaded area seems like a decent first step in a pullback. Beyond there, you'd have to look down to 4000. The 200-day moving average is around 3975. No, but again, this is still in play, right? This is one down day, so let's not draw any uh, dramatic conclusions from this. But I would say that the bull case certainly, of course, would involve the S&P getting above 4,200. I think the only way it really gets sustainably higher above that level is if you have broader participation. And some of the breadth indicators, which have been you know, anemic as the way I've, I've described them, really been not keeping up with the major index uh, level, the nominal levels of the indexes, uh, those would have to improve and on a day like today. You're certainly not... Uh, seeing that quite so much. And we've talked about the breadth conditions uh, being a little weaker than normal. Uh, the advanced decline lines here are not yet updated for today's drop. This is through yesterday's close, but I would be expecting most of these to finish the day below their 50-day moving average. And that shows you how we've get, gotten, again, uh, you know, overall breadth conditions much weaker than the major averages would probably give you the impression they should be. Let's finish off looking at some individual names here. NVIDIA is reporting earnings after the close yesterday. Um, my guest today, Doug Bush, was talking to him before we started. You know, I mentioned NVIDIA, and again, I think that's a, a key metric to watch. Uh, you know, earnings can be a catalyst in both ways, right? You can have upside catalyst uh, with a good earnings report, but a miss uh, on a stock like NVIDIA all of a sudden can drop uh, a, the growth space very, very quickly. What's interesting about the chart of NVIDIA is similar to a number of the other names we've talked about recently, which is that we're testing long-term highs, if not all-time all highs, right? We mentioned that recently with Apple. We've mentioned that with Microsoft. Consumer staple stocks, many of which, which are rolling over, things like Procter & Gamble and Pepsi and others, testing resistance and then, and then rolling over. And my question for an NVIDIA 
is do earnings provide enough of a a catalyst to power above resistance and show that investors are willing to pay more for this stock than they have in quite some time? I think that's a big question mark. Um, So again, we have a lot to to pay attention to. That's tomorrow after the close, if I remember right. Also wanted to mention uh, some of the candle uh, patterns we're seeing here. And again, I was looking at these earlier candles have a, a tendency to uh, to be uh, very uh, fluid until the close is locked in. But yeah, that's what I was I was thinking that Meta might have what's called a gravestone doji. And that's about as bullish as it sounds, to be honest with you, which is not very much. A gravestone doji is a traditional pattern where you open and close basically at the same level. You have little to no lower shadow and a big upper shadow, which means we opened the day, we traded much higher, we closed back at the lows. That is a bearish sign for stocks. This comes after yesterday, which was a shooting star candle, which is similar to what we saw today, but the open and close are a little separate, but both at the lower end of the range. So on Meta, which certainly been one of the stronger stocks uh, in the large cap space, showing some short-term distribution signs uh, just in the last uh, day or two. With Spotify, you're seeing this with some other things as well, some of these long upper shadows. And again, you can call these shooting stars, gravestone dojis. There's different labels that sort of describe this. But basically, the open and close at the lower end of the day and trading higher. And think about what that means, right? We're trading in an uptrend. We open a certain day. We trade higher. But there's an evaporation of buyers, right? And by the end of the day, we're right back where we started. That's why that is more of a short-term uh, bear signal. So leading into NVIDIA's earnings tomorrow, we're actually getting some uh, a bit of a, uh, a bearish sign here. I wanted to bring up PLTR, not for the candle chart, but just to show you um, the uh, the rally that we've seen. Again, I think the, the bull case for stocks is you need a lot more PLTRs out there. With the rally today up almost 7%, this is now the top-ranked stocks in our scooter uh, rankings for large cap space. That's our proprietary technical uh, trend-following tool trying to identify strength. Uh, big, nice up move, which is uh, which is pretty impressive. If you draw Fibonacci retracements over this period, we're not too far below uh, Fibonacci resistance, which is right around the April highs, which is just above current levels, maybe another point, point and a half or so. So again, what the, the issue I would have with some of these names that have been doing well is they're trading up to the point where all else being equal, I'd expect a bit of a retracement off of those highs. And we'll see if these stocks have enough gas left in the tank to push above resistance. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with Doug Bush of Chartsmarter.com. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. It's Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. So appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for our show. A couple quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, Doug Bush. First off, we'll do a mailbag segment at the end of this week. We'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. Our email is thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts TV YouTube channel. We'd love to hear from you. Hope to answer your question live on the air on Friday's show. Upcoming schedule tomorrow on Wednesday, the 24th, we have Andrew Thrasher, founder of Thrasher Analytics, coming to us from the Midwest, Indiana, if I remember right. On Thursday, the 25th, John Kosar, sticking with the Midwest theme here for midweek, we have John Kosar of Asbury Research in Chicago. He has an Asbury 6 um, uh, trend-following sort of breadth model. We'll see what that's telling us about the market environment here. Our latest episode of The Pitch is coming up on Thursday as well. Dave Landry, Mark Newton, Joe Rabel, I'm going to sit down with them virtually from the studio here. Uh, Ask them each to throw in five stock or ETF ideas. We'll hear their pitches, discuss them as a group. It's a fun exercise. You'll leave with some tickers jotted down with charts to review and, uh, and with ideas to put into play here going forward. Let us welcome on our guest today, Doug Bush. Doug is the CEO and founder of Chartsmarter.com, coming to us from the New York area. Doug, great to see you. How are you? Always great to be here, Dave. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking, buddy. It's it's good to see you. I appreciate you coming on. And I, I really appreciate you offering to dig into the energy sector a little bit. This has been an area of the market. You know, last year, there was a time where it felt like it was energy and everything else. And things have changed quite a bit. But now the question again, once again, is, is there an opportunity in that space? So I'm excited to hear where, where you want to go. But first, let's talk about the sector movements and how that's evolved over time here. Yeah, we'll take a look at this chart here. Uh, and this is the reason why overall I was a little bearish coming into this year. I just It's just a little bit extended. Look at those gains in 2021, 2022, both up better than uh, 50% in both years. An achievement like uh, tech hasn't even uh, produced in the last couple of decades. Last year, mm-hmm. as you said, I mean, look at that divergence. Energy was up 65%. Only one other sector was positive. That was utilities up just less than 2%. 
Um, so coming into 2023, like I said, I was a little bit bearish and, you know, it, it's been playing out a little bit. It is the worst performing uh, major S&P sector out of the 11 groups, down about 8%. And perhaps it'll duplicate that action, as you can see at the bottom of the chart, for three consecutive years between 2018 and 20. It was the worst behaved group. But tactically, I think some longs make sense here, Dave. Let's look at some of these names. And you had a, a note you just put out to clients, I know, that, that you shared with me. Let's start with Chevron. What's the, the take on this chart? Really testing support, I would say, right? Yeah, well, uh, late in January, look, I sent out a tweet on this name that read something like, look, there's nothing more bearish than a bullish setup that fails. And that's precisely <laughs> what happened. It tried to take out, uh, you can see on the left of the chart there, that cut base around 190. And that was after earnings, I believe, the last week of January. And, and, and I don't know if you remember, they had a huge $75 billion stock buyback. Mm -hmm. So when you see that kind of weak action on good news, not good. Um, this is the daily chart. But if we took a look at its weekly chart, its 50-week SMA is uh, starting, you know, the last couple of years has been very supportive. Starting to trade sideways since February. More importantly, it's below that line now after bumping off it in September 2021, July and September uh, last year. Small sample size, but it recaptured that line, fell back below it, a red flag. The daily chart here, you can see there, this is yesterday's close. I sent you these charts yesterday. It was a bear flag. I think it rose 3% today on an upgrade. We know it bought. Uh, it's trying to buy PDCE. Um, but I'm a little concerned with this one. 150 is your line in the sand there. And, of course, this is one of the biggest uh, holdings in that XLE. So it has mm. a big say of where, that, where this uh, group really goes. Yeah. So and, and again, I, I find people don't understand enough about the weightings on some of these larger names in ETFs like uh, sector ETFs. Right. I mean, XLY, XLK, even energy. You have a big couple of names that are an outsized weight. And Chevron, when you think about the performance weakness in Chevron or Exxon or both really can kill the performance of that over time. Chart number two is. Uh, OK, man. Yeah, right, right. SLB is your second one. Compare and contrast if you could. What's the opportunity here? Weekly chart. Weekly chart here, again, this is yesterday's uh, close. Uh, look, the equipment names, Dave, are acting a little bit better than uh, the exploration and production peers. The OIH is down about 20% from its 52-week highs. The XOP, like 27%. And like we just spoke about, a lot of these ETFs are top-heavy. I think Schlumberger and Halliburton make up one-third of the fund, if not more. So as they go, the go OIH goes. This we know is a former best-of-breed name. Looking to reclaim that status. I like to buy strength. You know that, Dave. So I want to see this name prove it to me with a move back above that 50-week SMA. Notice mm. if you go back a little bit on the chart, good things happen when that occurs. Most notably, the first week of 2022, this stock jumped the bike above that 50-week SMA, rose 17% that week. Again, in the, the first week of October last year, it rose 19%, and then it was off to the races again. So I want to see a close above 47 Friday. Dave, to capture my interest, that would then uh, offer a possible add on double bottom uh, it's base you can see there. Fascinating. And at the bottom, you're showing the relative strength. This is SLB versus the OIH, right? Not versus the S&P 500. So showing that relative performance, right? Correct. It's, you can see it going sideways there. So the most likely, you know, it was preceded by an uptrend. So, you know, hmm. most likely you're probably going to see a resolution to the upside there. Of course, nothing's a guarantee, but uh, time will tell. Time will tell indeed. Your next chart, EQT. What's the idea here? Testing resistance. Testing resistance. You can see there, you know, I, I think this is a real interesting play. If one looked at natural gas, uh, they'd see this is traded between, the, you know, I'll, I'll quote unquote the round two and three numbers since February. Um, it has the look of a nice rounded bottom as the bears have been able to push this lower. Amazingly, uh, you know, I'm the big round number theory guy. This, remember, natural gas hit 10 precisely last summer. Mm. Uh, before backing off but last week this stock displayed really good relative strength it was up better than eight percent on the second best uh weekly volume so far this year and it has a look at uh, on the weekly chart that is building the right side of a cup based pattern uh that stalled out at 50 twice uh in uh, in this year so far it's daily chart here that you could see here is sporting a bullish inverse head and shoulders pattern it's just above that breakout on 35 monday you had that uh, bullish counter attack uh, it's you know today it closed just again above 35. Last Friday it was rejected at that 200 day. Um, I think it can enter here and you know above the 200 day moving average again. I think this could move toward 50 later in this year. 
Mm. It's, it's interesting how you can contrast what you're seeing here with some of the other names we've looked at, particularly like CVX. I, I find a lot of times people think of the sector as a homogenous group of names, but there's actually a little more diversity than, uh, than some might expect, particularly if you get outside of uh, you know, the big integrated names. Peabody Energy, right? Peabody, BTU is the final chart. Yeah, this is a coal name, of course, is, you know, subject to some controversy. The group's had its ups and downs since that KOL ETF, if you remember, that was shut down in December of 2020. Yeah. Uh, this name, uh, again, I, I love the round number. I have an affinity with the round numbers. Uh, you can see it's trading toward the lower range of between 20 and 30 that started this year. Uh, on a year-to-date basis, truth be told, this is the laggard of the coal names. It's down about 20% when other names like HCC is, is slightly positive. AMR is about unch and CEIX down by about 6%. The, this is a very interesting location with this bullish hammer you see right off that 20 number at the bottom of the mm. chart. Uh, last Thursday on a weekly chart, you'd see this is the scene of a weekly cup-based breakout uh, there that occurred uh, last March where the stock jumped 65% in one week. <laughs> and yes, you did hear me right there, Dave, 65% in one week. Wow. All bets are off on this one. If this does break below 20, uh, I did not see the latest 13F on Elliott, but I believe they had a, almost a 20% holding in this name. Uh, so it's pretty significant. So, you know, look, good risk reward here with a tight leash. So when you're, and this is, these are great. I love the walk through some of, the, some of these individual names. Can you talk a little bit, uh, Doug, if you could? I mean, this is one of those environments where I know a lot of people are struggling. There's a lot of question marks about the broader environment, about the debt ceiling, right? The Fed rates uh, and, and just the fact that major indexes are testing resistance. How do you balance sort of that macro uncertain environment with your ability to identify opportunities in individual names? Any words of wisdom or how, do, how are you trying to balance that? Well, that's a great question. But, you know, again, I mean, all these macro points, you know, they're, they're, they're great talking points. But for me, I try and look at each individual instrument and try and see, you know, where the opportunity lies. There's debt ceiling. I mean, we have NVIDIA tomorrow that we were talking about. Um, energy itself, look, it's, I mean, th this is a sector, it did something very rare. It doubled its weighting in the S&P in two years. I mean, of course, it was coming from a, vo a very low base. But uh, that's why I think this has a good tactical uh, long opportunity. But um, yeah, I mean, very interesting times. Like we said, a lot of these things feel like they're priced to perfection. NVIDIA, um, energy, we'll see. We'll see if it could get a bounce here. I, I think there's some good tactical long plays. I'm a, I always like to buy strength. Mm. Of course, it's not many names that are showing strength. But we do with you know, these three charts. I think we see some nice bottoming patterns. With, if anything else, good risk reward, Dave. So you mentioned how you like to buy strength. And I know that from following you and your work for, for many years, Doug, and you, you do a, a, an incredible job of identifying these opportunities in, in any environment. How do you approach something like an NVIDIA? We mentioned it a couple of times, you know, earnings coming up this week. So less about the earnings, but more about the trend, right? It's had such a run so far with the big tech names that we've talked about, the communications names. Is there strength further to be had, or how do you how do you manage risk reward in something that's had a run like an Nvidia so far? Well, wow, I get you know that's another great question. I guess first you got to see what your basis is. I mean, if you rode mm -hmm. this trend uh, from last October, maybe you can wait it out. If you're a long term guy, you have to go through you know four of these examples every year with earnings. But um, again, is it priced to perfection? I mean, you could have a good number and the stock could still sell off. I mean, you know, people mm. say PEs. I'm not a big looker at PEs, but I'm looking at that uh, 176 right there. That you know, that that's a little eye popping. Mm -hmm. And again, it's testing those uh, you know all time highs back from uh, late 2021. That was a good eye on your part. But look, this has been showing strength. Uh, you want your generals to lead. Let's see what happens uh, tomorrow after the close, and not only at tomorrow after the close, but let's see how it closes. On, uh, on, uh, on Wednesday. That's going to be even more important on Thursday, I'd rather. Yeah, I, I feel like there's a lot of game left with some of these charts. We only have about 30 seconds left, Doug, but would you, I mean, w we have the situation right now where it's a relatively small number of names that have had an incredible year. The average stock has had kind of a choppy, uncertain year. Um, you mentioned the general's doing pretty well. How important is it in your process to see more participation from other names, maybe energy or other parts of the market, in terms of an overall bullish thesis for stocks? Yeah, I think it's very important. I did write a note this week, uh, this weekend, about the NASDAQ. New, new highs on the NASDAQ are starting to perk up a little bit. 
software is acting well. I definitely mm. want to see some more participation, but I think it's a little better than the tone that everyone tries to set out there. I hear the S and P five, you know, the other four ninety five, which is true. But the market's holding up uh, so far. So if these names could play catch up, I think we could have a nice run. I think sentiment's still pretty bearish overall, Dave. Doug, this is awesome. Thanks for uh, sharing some energy charts and, and being willing to go anywhere at, at the end there. Stay safe and be well in New York. We'll uh, hope to see you again soon, all right? You got it, Dave. Thanks for having me on. That's Doug Bush. Doug's the CEO and founder of Chartsmarter.com, coming to us from a beautiful North Fork of uh, Long Island, New York. Uh, Doug's awesome. And, and again, he's one of those guys that has used stock charts longer and more effectively than I have. So every time he sends his charts that he wants to bring on the, uh, on the show, I'm thinking, oh, man, I wish I, could, I, wish I was that good at, at sort of making the charts look a certain way. Uh, but I love how we talk about the energy space, right, and thinking about how it's not just one stock, it's not just one name. When you really look underneath the hood and think Think about all the different parts within energy. There's a lot of different uh, bets in there. There's sort of traditional big integrateds. There's uh, E&P stocks. There's pipelines. There's natural gas. There's a bunch of different things that are sort of in there. Um, so make sure you do, 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 do your due diligence and look for opportunities across some of these sectors. Great take there, as always, from uh, Doug Bush at Chart Smarter. We need to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. Uh, you know, we looked at NVIDIA a couple times, came up in our, our conversation uh, there about, you know, stocks having an incredible run and an example of a name that has had a nice move, but now testing resistance. Just wanted to share this chart showing Apple and Coke. Now, two very different names, two very different sectors, very different paths. However, look at the similarities between these charts and that they're both sort of having multiple tests of resistance. With Apple, it's sort of in this 175 to 180 range. With Coke, it was down in the 64 to 65 range. Uh, Coke has tested this resistance a number of times here. It's now pulling back off of resistance. And I would say two observations on this. Number one, certainly appears to be rolling off of resistance. Another failed attempt to get above 64 to 65 and demonstrate that there's somewhere else to go. The other side of it, though, is, boy, if and when it gets above 65, talk about a huge base with upside potential. But it's a big if until I see the proof of price moving above that resistance, I have to consider it a level that we're unable to eclipse just yet. That's what I'm seeing on Coke. I'm wondering if what we're seeing with Coke and uh, Pepsi and the PG is a preview of what we might see from some of these bigger tech names like Apple and Microsoft, maybe NVIDIA as well. Tomorrow, we'll probably get some clarity on NVIDIA. Let's see what happens through the remainder of this week. But initially, a bit of a pullback from that level of resistance. Chart number two, this is a chart I share with my uh, premium members at Market Misbehavior uh, every week, and it's looking at currencies and commodities, just a way of thinking about the landscape. Uh, gold having an okay day today, while other risk assets were uh, struggling. The G, uh, sorry, this is the gold continuous contract testing 1950 on my chart. And that's the support level that I've highlighted in purple. That lines up pretty well with the resistance we had uh, in January and February. So resistance now potentially coming support. I'm wondering if this is the opportunity. If stocks do go a little bit more risk off and roll down, I would not be surprised to see gold sort of bounce uh, back up, test uh, break above 2000 and test previous resistance. Uh, I think gold still has a good opportunity here in 2023. But again, let's let the, uh, the, the proof uh, come in the price. The dollar strengthening has been holding gold down. If the dollar rolls over, that would certainly be an important part of that. Chart number three, Win. Win is one of the gambling names pulling back today. One of the worst groups in the S&P today. Win was down about 6%. Others like LVS sort of uh, moving down as well. The challenge for this chart here is we're now testing support potentially going below there. I've, I've identified resistance in blue. It's around $116. I have support in green around 101, 102. You can see this is a support level we've tested a number of times just today, closing below that level. Do we see a follow through through the remainder of this week? That is an open question for win and the gambling stocks. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. All of our previous interviews can be found for free at StockChartsTV.com. Thank you to Doug Bush of Chartsmarter joining us from New York. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow.